morning. So just leave your hand up if you need a Bible, and uh, we want to get one in your hands. Um, I'm going to talk away all my announcements before I know there's one other thing that I wanted to mention. Um, and this, um, you know, just comes as an exhortation uh, that, uh, you know, we, uh, we are moving. We're making a move. We're going to need, as Dave said, help. Physical hands of labor. And um, we're, we're going to ask that, uh, that you do uh, really pray about how God can use you in that area. There's another area that we can use your help. Uh, we, we haven't set up a thermometer up here, you know, and watch the money go up as we beg and ask and plead and cry out for, uh, you know, help. Uh, where God guides, He's provided, and, and, and He has provided. But the one thing that we have asked from you is prayer. And I'm not saying that you aren't praying at home. But, you know, a couple weeks now, we've been having prayer meetings down at Miramonte. And, you know, there's just a handful of us, and I thank God for the handful that are coming to pray, that are coming to uh, really join our hearts together and lock our shields of faith together to just uh, go before the Lord. And, and I pray that you have been praying, uh, you know, for us. Uh, you know, there, there was, as I say, that handful that was there last week, there were three people who were there that weren't even from our fellowship to pray for us. And, and that cut the uh, down by uh, quite a bit. So I'm just asking uh, that when we do have our prayer meetings, you pray about maybe your presence. You know, it's good that you would come and to, uh, to just lock your shield of faith together with us. We, we, we don't say this lightly. We are going to make this move because we are praying, because we are seeking the Lord, because we are following Him. And so I just ask for your prayers and, and if, uh, you know, when, when we get together that maybe God would just move upon your heart to join us, uh, to be there in prayer. So with that, let's look at Hebrews chapter uh, 7 this morning. Um, at first read, I don't know if you've read ahead, we kind of go book by book, verse by verse, so you, you that are here on a more consistent basis, you know where we left off, where we're likely to pick up the next week, although there can be surprises. Uh, but we are in chapter 7, and, and upon the first read, it might not seem like a very significant chapter. Uh, it might even be a little bit difficult even to understand. The book of Hebrews is probably not the easiest uh, book to understand, um, but yet the Lord, as we seek Him and we go before Him in prayer, before we open up the Word, He will indeed uh, reveal to us uh, what He is uh, wanting us to gather and, and to glean from the Word. To the readers that the writer is writing to here, Jewish believers, uh, this is big. They're struggling right now with their faith. And so, if the writer was going to really uh, make his argument concerning faith alone in Jesus Christ as a means of establishing a right standing before God, if, if, he, if he's going to be able to make this argument stick, then there must be good explanation for Jesus' priesthood. Jesus Christ, a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, one, one significant thing to point out here, and why this is important, is because Jesus was not of the tribe of Levi, or Levi, however you want to pronounce uh, his name. Now, he wasn't of the family of Aaron. This was the ordained priesthood ingrained in the heart of the people that the writer was actually writing to at this time. And the, 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 the recipients were struggling now with their faith. And so this chapter, the whole book of Hebrews, because it talks about the priesthood of Jesus Christ, not after Levi or the family of Aaron, but after a whole other order, the order of Melchizedek. And so uh, this system of worship that they understood that was ingrained in their heart, now they're getting something very revolutionary. This is new to their way of thinking. You know, the way that these people, uh, the Jewish people approached God was to bring their sacrifices to the priests. And then they would take them and they would make the offering before God. Now something different is happening. And so we want to see how the writer handles himself because as we've talked about before, the exhortation was to go on to maturity. That's what we've talked about in the last several chapters. Go on to perfection. Go on to maturity. 
And so he says, if, if this is going to happen, then you have to understand the order of Melchizedek, the priesthood, according to the order of Melchizedek. Because no longer is the, is the priesthood after Aaron and Levi applicable. And so let's see how the writer handles himself as he explains Jesus Christ, a priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, he, he dropped this bombshell uh, on them uh, a couple chapters earlier, a little bit earlier. And now he's got to defend it. Uh, and so as we look at chapter 7, we're going to take the first 17 verses this morning. And, and we're also going to see that they have, I believe, some special meaning for us today. Better have. For this Melchizedek, and he's mentioned him now beginning in chapter 5. He's talked about this guy. King of Salem... Priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated King of Righteousness, and then also King of Salem, meaning King of Peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are the sons of Levi, who receive the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises." Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. Even Levi, who received tithes, uh, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident, if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Father, bless your word this morning. And bless our hearts, Lord, as we seek God to glean, uh, Lord, from your word this morning, uh, even that, Lord, which would be applicable to our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High, God who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, then king of Salem, meaning king of peace, is without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like, this is important, the Son of God, remains a priest continually. We spoke of Melchizedek earlier uh, a couple times as we've looked at chapter 5 and uh, and chapter 6. And there's probably no more unique person uh, in all of Scripture. He's only mentioned twice in the Old Testament. And yet this man is given such a great place of honor. In Genesis chapter 14, you just might jot down this, um, uh, this chapter, chapter 14, and in verses 18 through 20 is where we're told that Melchizedek just appears on the pages of Scripture after Abraham uh, had learned that his uh, nephew Lot uh, had been taken captive uh, by certain kings, and uh, he took off with a band of men uh, to go and rescue Lot from uh, his, uh, his place of captivity. And after his victory, after he's coming back home, 
Here this guy Melchizedek just appears and he brings him, he blesses Abraham with wine and bread. Now that's really significant in and of itself because I mean immediately it takes us to uh, the Last Supper, it takes us to Jesus Christ, it takes us you know, to, to really just pointing to him. But Abraham, after Melchizedek blessed him, uh, bringing, bringing wine and bringing bread, then Abraham turned around and honored him with a tenth of his victory spoil. Now you would have thought that it would have been the other way around for sure. That Abraham, who was blessed by God, would have received the greater honor. We'll talk more about that as we, as we get on into this chapter. But it was, you know, that, that Abraham, in turn, uh, paid tribute to Melchizedek. Now, the other place that we read about uh, Melchizedek, David prophesies that Messiah will come after the order of Melchizedek in Psalm 110, verse 4. He prophesies that he would be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. No other mention of Melchizedek uh, in the Old uh, Testament. No other information do we have about him except here in Hebrews chapter 5, 6, and 7. Notice in verse 3, we have several interesting things that are mentioned about Melchizedek. He is king of righteousness. That's what Melchizedek means. Melech means king. Sedek means righteousness. He is also the king of Salem. Shalom. Peace. He is the king of peace. Some say that, uh, uh, suggest that Salem is, a, uh, is an ancient name for, uh, an ancient, for uh, the city of Jerusalem. So uh, Jerusalem means peace. And so he is the king of righteousness, king of Salem, but also we read that he was a priest of the Most High God. El Elyon, meaning the highest. There is none above him. When reference is made in Genesis 14, verse 19, it tells us that he is also the possessor of heaven and earth. But he is the highest one, El Elyon. But the interesting thing about Melchizedek is he is both king and he is a priest. In the Old Testament, God made the throne and the altar. They were held in distinction. They were separate. The two offices were separate. If you were a priest, you had to be of the tribe of Levi and of the family of Aaron to be a priest. Uh, you could not be a king. If you were a king, you could not be a priest according to uh, the law of Moses. But here we read of Melchizedek, who was both king and priest. And this is significant because here's where we talk about Jesus Christ, a, a, a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Something entirely, entirely different and new. Before the law of Moses was given, Melchizedek held both offices, making him a type of Jesus Christ, who being a priest after the order of Melchizedek, who would also hold these offices. Uh, this is prophesied, as I said, in Psalm uh, 110, verse 4, but also you might use a cross-reference of Zechariah, uh, chapter 6, verse 13, where the prophet Zechariah also makes mention of this. Jesus is our great high priest. We also know that he is king of kings. In him, he combines that which was separate among men, which God said this would, these, this would be separate. The Levitical priesthood was national. It pertained to Israel and to the Jews. The Melchizedek priesthood is universal. It pertains to all. And so the only time that we're ever going to ever see the joining of such spiritual things and governmental things, the king and the priest, is in the person of Jesus Christ when he comes to establish his kingdom upon the earth. These titles, king of righteousness and king of peace, are interesting to us as well. The role of every Old Testament priest was to show the people, was to show the people how to have a right standing before God, how to come and to be right with God, but also how to have peace in their heart, 
Today we know that the only way of true peace and righteousness is found through faith in Jesus Christ. Turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. As Paul writes to these uh, believers in Rome. In a couple of Paul's books, he actually... Um, follows along the same lines as the writer of Hebrews. And by the way, there are some that think Paul did write Hebrews, but it's not mentioned as such per se, so I'll just kind of make reference to whoever the writer was. But uh, in Galatians and in Romans, uh, Paul writes to these um, believers uh, about the same things because there was a lot of pull and a lot of tension uh, between those uh, who were um, uh, Jews who had become Christians and the Jews who are trying to pull them back uh, into um, uh, Judaism. But notice in verse 1 of Romans chapter 5, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, declared righteous, in other words, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. These two go together. Turn to Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17. And they always go together in this order. Righteousness... And then peace. One must really be declared righteous before God before there can ever be really peace in their heart. But the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17. And last time, a couple of times ago, I just better make sure that my computer got that right. <laughs> yeah, you laugh. It's not funny when you stand up here. Isaiah 32, 17. The work of righteousness will be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quiet and assurance forever. Quietness and assurance forever. Awesome. The work of righteousness. When God works in our lives. When we come to God through faith in Jesus Christ. Washed clean of our sins. Forgiven of our sins. Declared righteous. The effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Though the mountains, you know, fade away, though the, you know, the, the worlds crumble and, and, and the mountains crumble into the sea and all that, you know, we can still have a peace in our heart because we are building upon the rock-solid foundation of Jesus Christ, who He said in the Sermon on the Mount, though the winds come and though the, the storms come upon us, you know, because we have built upon the rock, it's a solid rock. And we're going to stand when our faith is in the rock of our salvation. Well, jot down Psalm 85, verse 10. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Melchizedek could not make men righteous. He could not give them peace in their hearts. But Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, these two come together. And through faith in Him, and in Him alone, one is declared righteous and has a right standing before God. And thereby, peace has been made with God, has been established with God. Therefore, we can know the peace that passes all understanding in our hearts. You know, Jesus asked the Father. He told His disciples, He said, When I ascend into heaven, I will ask the Father that He would send the Holy Spirit and the Comforter, and He would come alongside to help you. And so upon His return into heaven, we see that this happens. This is how we know we, the peace. Because God sent the Holy Spirit. Jesus went and ascended to heaven. He asked the Father to send the Comforter, the Paracletus, to come and to, uh, to, to, to give comfort to the hearts of the people. Believers, we should know that peace that passes all understanding, even in a world that is troubled and so unsettled as our world is. Even as things, even in your life, may be unsettled, we should still have a peace in our hearts. It's only when our eyes are not focused upon the Lord, but they're focused upon the circumstances, that we become unsettled in our life, and then we begin to strive Peace I leave with you, Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 27. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be 
afraid. His peace. You know, many are the brokenhearted in this life. Why? Because they fail to fully surrender to Jesus Christ. And what's really sad is when believers fail to appropriate the peace that Jesus has given us in our own lives. Where every test of faith is another crisis. Where every trial is a moment of stressful anxiousness. Jesus said, peace I give unto you. My peace. Not the peace that the world gives. But my peace. Even a peace that passes all understanding. When we try to figure things out, we think, oh, I've got it figured out. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable now. And then tomorrow when we wake up, all of a sudden, we're right back to the same place we were. We're unsettled. It's not worked out. How I thought was going to be worked out, it isn't worked out like that. And I become unsettled. Peace I give to you, Jesus said. My peace. Not the peace that you can conjure up in your own heart. Not the peace that the world gives, which is a pseudo peace. But my peace. But not your heart. Be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. The struggle of these believers, they were unsettled. They didn't know peace at this particular time because they were trying by their own efforts, like I just spoke about, to assure themselves of peace and of God's approval. They, they felt, well, I, I'm really unsettled in my life. If I just go back or if we just go back to the rituals and the rules and the regulations of the law... That'll bring us peace. Today, people do the same thing. Christians do the same things by, being, by finding themselves under a weight of legalism. And you know what? So many believers who get under this, 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 this thing of legalism, this doo-doo religion as I like to call it, you know, they get under, they get under this weight, they get under this burden, and then you know because they're not settled, then they come and they're, they're showing you that you've got to do-do if you're going to be really comfortable, if you're going to be at peace. And it's one big vicious circle. And it just leads to a strife and, and stressful life. If they just do more, I'll show God, I'll show God I'm worthy. I'm worthy of His grace. Oh, boy. Today we should know the only way that that even comes in any way to our hearts is because we believe, because we trust, because Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is comforting us. Verse 3 tells us more of Melchizedek being a type of Jesus Christ and that there's no record of his genealogy. He was without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Now, genealogy was everything to the Aaronic priesthood, to the priesthood according to Aaron. Uh, you, as you read in, in, in Ezra and Nehemiah, when they were coming back from captivity, when the uh, Jews, when Israel was coming back from, cap, from captivity in Babylon, and they had, you know, built the temple again, and, and they were, you know, determining, you know, they, uh, who, who, were the, who the priests were. They had to prove their genealogy. And if they couldn't prove their genealogy, then they could, not, they could not be priests before the Lord. They had to go back, and they had to prove that they were the line of Levi uh, and of the family of Aaron. But in the case of Melchizedek, he had no, he had no known uh, existence or genealogy. He didn't have his priesthood handed down to him because he was of a certain family or by his father. And so this is clear contrast that the writer is making here to these people about this new, this new priesthood, this better priesthood. With no record of his beginning or end, in this way he remains a priest forever, resembling Jesus, resembling Jesus who existed from before his birth from before he entered into this realm of time that we know it's his linear time. You know, his, his, his existence was from beyond whew, as far back as you can think. How far back can you think? Where was, was Jesus there? Yep. And even beyond that, however far you can think back, 
You know, he was beyond the shadow of how far you can think back. Because the Bible tells us that before the worlds began, he was. He was. Some believe Melchizedek was an angel. I don't agree with them. Because the priesthood was of human. It wasn't of, it wasn't of angels. Some believe that uh, Melchizedek is simply a theophany. That means the, an, old, an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. Uh, certainly the bread and the wine, as I mentioned before, they become significant. But I think that Melchizedek was a real person. Even as it says here that he was made like, uh, you know, uh, our Lord. My personal belief. That's my personal belief. Look at verse 4. Now consider how great this man was, though. Look how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Now here, as I said, we're at the heart of Hebrews. The priesthood is the focal point of Judaism. And now they're being confronted with another priesthood. I think it is very interesting that Abraham, as great as he was, he was called by God. He was known as a friend of God. James chapter 2, verse 23. He was a man who was declared righteous because of his faith. James writes in that same verse, and Paul writes in Romans chapter 4, verse 9. He was singled out in Genesis chapter 12 when God called him. He was singled out as the one through whom all the nations of the world would be blessed. He was under no obligation, if I'm, you know, thinking about this, under no obligation at all to make tithes to Melchizedek. But still, he recognized the superiority and the greatness of this man, and he honored him. He honored him. In a similar manner, as Melchizedek is shown honor by Abraham, so Jesus Christ is to receive all power, all glory, all worship by all men as the great high priest and king, as his priesthood is universal. You know, one doesn't even give to Jesus Christ because they have to. And that's something, you know, that we learn here from Abraham and Melchizedek. Abraham gave to Melchizedek because he recognized his greatness and his superiority. But in the same way, you know, we, uh, one does not have to really uh, give honor to, uh, to Jesus Christ. But we do it because in our heart of hearts we have recognized our faith has been activated and we know who is like unto our God. There is not one. And so we bow before Him. We, we, we lay, we are to present our bodies upon the altar of sacrifice. And we offer unto Him that which is worthy of Him. So even as Abraham willfully paid tributes, even as he gave honor to Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, we too honor our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, we don't know how Abraham knew this, but even as our hearts are moved upon, you know, even as the Holy Spirit has come to us who believe and who know Jesus Christ in a personal and living way, we know that there is none like unto our God, and we worship Him, and we honor Him, and we are obedient unto Him and His Word. It's just by faith. I know because I know. God has opened up the, the, faith of, uh, the door of my understanding of faith. And because I believe, I worship and I honor him. Jesus is deserving of the greatest honor. Search your heart this morning as to how you honor the Lord. How you give unto the Lord. It says here that Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils from his victory to this man. Uh, the word spoils is a very interesting word. Acrothenion, it is in the Greek. And it's a word that means the cream of the crop. The best of the best. 
When he defeated all of these armies, there were five, uh, five kings, uh, four or five kings that he defeated. And he had all of this uh, that, he, that he had taken from these kings. And it says here, when, he gave, uh, when Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of the spoils, he gave him the best. He didn't go scooting around, oh, let me see here what I can give this. He took it right off the top. He gave him the, the cream of the crop, and this is what is required of each and every believer in our giving unto the Lord. You know... I think so often what God gets from many believers is what's left over. After we make sure that we've taken care of ourselves. Forgetting that God is the one who gave us the ability to get and to have anyway. He has given us the ability to even live and breathe or breathe and live. And so all of the gifts and the talents and abilities that we have all of the means that we have to attain and possess, God has given that ability to us. I spoke to one brother last week when he was a brand new Christian. He understood this principle. And even in a very difficult time, a new Christian, he told me how God had remained faithful to him, to him, even when he was without a job. He never undermined this principle in his life to give unto God that which would honor him and how God blessed him and has continued blessing him even unto this day throughout the years. God will always be faithful to his word. I'm not talking just about money, but I do find it very interesting that this is one way and one place about money a lot here. And maybe that's to our shame. We don't talk about giving, but it is an act of worship. You know, the last time I talked to this, maybe some of you or many of you may not even have been a part of our fellowship. Because we don't talk about it. We believe that, you know, we just know because we know that we give unto the Lord. We give of our time, we give of our resources, we give of our abilities, we give of our gifts. But I find it very interesting that God somehow boils this down to the very bare whatever when he talks about money. That's just very interesting to me. When he talks about our faithfulness, there's one place and there's only one place that I know of that God challenges his people as to his faithfulness. And it's interesting that it has to do with money. Turn to Malachi. Chapter 3, Malachi. And one of the reasons I feel that God points this out, and in several occasions he does, is because he knows what money can do to a person. How money can put a stranglehold upon a person's life. Jesus spoke to a man, a rich young ruler. And you can read about it in Matthew chapter 19, Mark chapter 10, uh, Luke chapter 18. And where this guy came to him and, and he asked him, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus told him a few things to do. He said, Lord, I've done all those things. He said, go, good. Go and sell all you have. And it says the guy turned away and he was grieved in his heart. He couldn't do it. He's the only guy that I know of that Jesus really challenged is the money. But he knew that the money was what was in his way of a relationship with God. And unfortunately, it gets in the way of so many. So many of our lives. Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money. Money is money's neutral. But he says, the love of money is the root of all evils. 1 Timothy chapter 10, verse 6. He says that those who desire, in other words, they have a passion, and that is the passion, and that is the drive of their life. I'm going to be rich. I'm going to have a house up on the hill. I'm going to have five cars in my garage. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, you know... Have, 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 have. And he says that those who desire, that's the passion of their life, they fall into temptation and a snare. Foolish lusts drown them uh, in destruction. And he says even that some stray from the faith. First Timothy chapter 6. Malachi chapter 3, though, 
Beginning in verse 8, we read, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that, that there may be food in my house, and try me now. Test me now says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will uh, not be room enough to receive it. Pretty amazing. There's the test. I mean, you can read that. I mean, God ministered to your heart in the way that, um, you know, how your heart is open. Is God given, though? Let's just talk about this. Is God given the glory? Is he given all glory, all power, all honor, all praise by receiving, by receiving the spoils, the cream of the crop of your life? The best of the best each week, each month, each year. We don't beg at Calvary. As I said, you know what? We don't even talk about this very much. Maybe it is to our shame because I believe many Christians are experiencing a little. Many Christians are experiencing a little, not just here, but throughout the world, from the hand of God in provision because it's simply a little that's given and then it's given grudgingly. The spiritual principle goes like this, jotted down, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Proverbs 11.24, jot it down, because i really got to move on here. <laughs> there is one who scatters, yet increases more, and there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. You know, in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus gives a spiritual principle uh, Luke records what, you know, spiritual principles that Jesus is giving. It's kind of like the Sermon on the Mount uh, there in Luke. And we've uh, commented upon that. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. Will God pour into your heart as you, as you pour uh, out into others? Read Second Samuel, chapter 24. I think it's Second Samuel. Hang on. <laughs> well, we know that won't work. Or will it? Let me see. Yep. Second Samuel chapter 24. Whole uh, series of events there that David, after he'd numbered the people, God told, don't, don't number the people. God number, and he numbered the people. And then God gave him, you know, as he repented before the Lord. I don't, I don't want to tell you the whole story because it's going to take... I'll elaborate too much. You go read it, okay? But anyway, David said, you know, when he, was, uh, when he went to get a field to make an offer and a sacrifice to the Lord, he went to this king, and, and the king said, just take the field. And David said, no. I will not take and offer unto the Lord anything that did not cost me something. So there's sacrifice. Sacrifice. We better get back to our text. <laughs> the writer continues his argument showing the priesthood that follows Melchizedek must be greater than the priesthood that comes from Abraham and that Abraham acknowledged and honored Melchizedek with tithes and acts of worship. Uh, and, he, and, and he wants his readers to take this out, you know, uh, clear out to Jesus Christ, who is a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Verse 5, And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who receive the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promise. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. And so... This is all now in defense of the priesthood of Melchizedek being superior to the priesthood of Aaron. According to the law, tithes were given to the priests, the sons of Levi, as an act of worship and obedience to the Lord's command, honoring them as God's representative. They had no inheritance in the land. They were provided for by their brethren. All of the other tribes and even those of the tribe of Levi who were not priests, they too supported them. 
And so they were, they were supported in such a way. But now here we have Melchizedek. He wasn't a descendant of Abraham, but Abraham honored him in that he tithed to him. He says, when Abraham, the writer says here, when Abraham honored Melchizedek, descendants of Abraham, in essence, were giving honor to the superior priesthood themselves. The writer's reasoning is awesome. It's kind of like what Paul said about all have sinned in Adam. You know, when Adam sinned in the garden, you know, he sinned, we sinned. That's why all are sinners and come short of the glory of God. When Abraham tithed, all of Levi, all of Levi uh, tithed unto Melchizedek also. So here we have Abraham who had received the promises from God. The greater. He received the promises right from God that in him, all, in him all the nations of the world would be blessed. But here we have the greater blessing Melchizedek who would appear to be the lesser. Certainly bringing attention to the superiority of his priesthood over Aaron's. I hope you follow that. I hope you see what, what he's trying to say here. Verse 80 tells us that in a little different way. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. So important, so significant. Here on earth, in the Levitical system, the priests received tithes. They were mortal men. They came and they went. They died. When one died, there was another that took his place. Fact is, they were only allowed to serve between the ages of 25 and 50. But Abraham paid tithes even before the Levitical system was ever put in to practice, giving honor to the type that lives on the greater priesthood according to Melchizedek. Verse 9, even Levi who receives tithes paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. And so the thought is repeated. Levi through Abraham uh, paid tithes honoring the greater priesthood. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> Therefore, if perfection, he's making his point here, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? The word perfection here means completion. If in the Levitical system everything was brought to completion and perfection, why was there a need for another why was there a need for another priesthood? See, under the law and the Levitical system, there was no perfection. It was insufficient to make men righteous. As you read in the Old Testament, this was a continual process. The people would sin, it would come. And it was like from morning till night, from morning to night. All the sacrifices, one after another, being offered. The next day, they, um, I, you know, how'd they get anything done? You know, when they recognized that they had sinned, they had to go get a little, you know, sheep or something out of their flock and bring it to, uh, bring it to, the, um, to the priest. And, and just one big, it's over and over and over again. Because as we're told a little bit later on in Hebrews, it says that those sacrifices only covered over sin. But it's Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who came to take away the sin of the world. And so, under the law, the Levitical system, there was no perfection. It was insufficient. Fact is, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 and 11, Paul writes, For as many as are of the works of the law are under its curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. Why? Because no one can keep the law. No one can keep the law. It's impossible. It's impossible. If you don't think so, well, think about it a little harder. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with the law. The law did what it was supposed to do. It worked just fine in fulfilling its purpose to show men the deeper need in their heart. And how hopeless and helpless as they were making the round trip trek, you know, to the altar, you know, in and out, in and out. And the priest, you know, oh, God, here comes uh, this guy again. You know, didn't we just see him yesterday morning, you know, and one after another. You know, but we saw how helpless uh, man is apart from, from Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God, who took away the sin of the world. 
Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. The, bra the law brought no one to perfection. So the scripture anticipated, as I said before, in Psalm 110, verse 4, and, and in Zechariah uh, chapter 6, verse 13 also, uh, another priesthood that would be superior to the Levitical priesthood. Perfection would have to come through another priesthood, through another system, a new law. Verse 12, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. Moses... You know, his focus was earthly. It was national. It was all of the Jews. It was temporal. And so God gave the law as a school teacher to get men to, men to see their deeper need and to look beyond to the heavenly provision. The Mosaic law couldn't bring per, uh, perfection. And so the law had to be changed. And when Jesus came, he fulfilled the law. He perfectly answered every demand that the law made. And at the point of his death at Calvary, he became that lamb without spot or blemish, the perfect sacrifice accepted by God. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood, because his, was con his focus was on, it was national, it was on, it was on Israel. God, in doing this, is not trying to improve upon the old covenant, trying to make it better because it served His purpose. But He simply established a new covenant, one that is everlasting. Jesus Christ is a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. A priest forever. He lives. He continues on. His priesthood is universal. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment but according to the power of an endless life. He lives. For he testifies, you are a priest forever, speaking of Jesus Christ, according to the order of Melchizedek. Which of the, of the priests uh, after Aaron, uh, the order of Aaron, which of them lived forever? Which of them uh, led a, had an endless life? None. None of the priesthood of Aaron. Though they were vital to the national life of Israel, their ministry was incomplete. But in the big picture, it's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so today, not according to the law of, the fle of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. See, it all gets down to Jesus Christ, His resurrection, and ascension. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, he died, but death couldn't hold him. He is alive, he is risen from the dead, and he is the one to whom we give honor today. A priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. He is the one to be worshipped and praised. He is the one to whom we give honor and glory and power forever. To him who loved us and gave his life for us, and today ministers on our behalf before the throne of God as our great high priest. Isn't that awesome? He ministers before the throne of God today. I just want to close with this verse that Paul wrote to the church of, uh, churches in Galatia, encouraging them, even as the writer does here, Stand fast, therefore. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. See, these people were being drawn back. These were believers who were being drawn back. A yoke of bondage was being put upon them. Follow the law. You'll be okay. No, 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 no. Follow Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And he will set you free. Let's pray. Father, to these people and Lord, to us today, you're so awesome in how you work things out. And Lord, how today, through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, we've been freed. Freed from sin, the penalty of sin, the bondage of sin, and the yoke of bondage forever and ever. 
Lord, we thank you for the work that you did at Calvary 2,000 years ago. And Father, even as the writer is encouraging these believers, Lord, if they're going to go on to maturity to focus on the one that is greater, the one that is greater than the priesthood of Aaron, the one who lives on forever and ever according to the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, so must we, Lord. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Father, we pray that, Lord, that peace that passes all understanding will be settled in our hearts. Lord, that we wouldn't come under that trip of having to do, do. Do something to make us feel better. And you say, just believe. And Father, I pray, Lord, for believers today. I pray today that they would be at rest. I pray today they would be at peace because your peace, Lord, you have given. Not as the world gives, but your peace. And we would rest in that peace today. Even in trying moments in our lives, tests, crises, disappointments, frustration. I pray, Lord, that we'd find a place of rest and a peace that passes all understanding joined us who have never come into a personal and living relationship with you through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that today, indeed, Lord, would be the day that they take that step of faith. That they take the step of faith, Lord, and recognize their need. Their need. That they are a sinner who needs a Savior. And that, Jesus, you are the Savior of the world. And that 2,000 years ago, you laid your life down at Calvary. Shed your blood at Calvary that we might have that peace, that we might be justified before you and be secure in our salvation. Father, if there's any here today, Lord, who have never taken that step of faith, never acknowledged that they're a sinner, but because of what Adam did, Lord, just follows through. He gave to man every, the best he could give us, and that was sin. And so, Lord, something must be done with that. And man must deal with that in his own life personally. And, Father, we say the way to do that is to bring our lives before you, confess our sin before you, and receive, God, the free gift that you offer, salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. If there's any this morning that would take that step of faith, that have never taken that step of faith in their life. Can I pray for you this morning? We acknowledge this morning that you are a sinner who needs a Savior. And if I can pray for you this morning, will you just please lift your head where you're seated this morning? And I just want to pray for you. Do you want to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior this morning? God bless you. Is there anyone else this morning who says, yes, I am a sinner. I need Jesus if there's anyone else here, please make eye contact with me this morning. Just lift your head and look at me right now. So I look around the room. Anyone else at all who says, yes, I need Jesus. I want Jesus. Well, this morning, just pray this prayer. Pray in your heart. Heavenly Father, thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me and dying for my sins. I receive you into my life as my personal Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I might serve you all the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the hope that I now have in you. I trust you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for saving me. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. Let's stand. Go ahead. of the Lord saying who shall I 
Christ said, who will go for us? I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall I send? Who will go for us? Here I am, Lord. Use me as you will. Send me, Lord, to spread the news until I will go, Lord, in glory. But till then, send me, Lord.